A number of you have asked me to respond to Lydia McGrew's lengthy critique of my book, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? Now that I've been able to complete some of my projects, I've had some time to read McGrew's book and will now respond. To begin, I want to explain what led me to the approach to gospel differences I've adopted. In the latter half of the 20th century, several scholars proposed that the gospels belong to the genre of ancient biography. Richard Burridge's 1992 book, What Are the Gospels?, ended up moving the world of New Testament scholars to think that, at minimum, most if not all of the gospels share much in common with the genre of ancient biography. Even before Burridge's book, classicists had been writing on ancient biography and how it differed in some respects from modern biography. Ancient biography had different objectives and allowed more flexibility in the way the past was reported than how modern historians write. A question that remained to be answered is, how might this impact the way we should read the Gospels? New Testament scholar Craig Keener began research on the Gospels to see how their biographical nature plays out. Several of his doctoral students have conducted focused research in this area as well. I focused on it too. The first step I took was to make a list of all the extant biographies written within around 150 years of Jesus, before and after, about 300 years in all. Biographies were called lives at that time. The English word biography did not come along until the 17th century. I began reading those biographies, starting with Plutarch's Lives. Many classicists assess Plutarch to be the greatest biographer in antiquity. Plutarch began writing his lives at the end of the first century and continued writing them until sometime shortly after the year 120. He wrote more than 60 lives of which 48 have survived. Nine of the 48 feature main characters who were Romans, most of whom knew one another with many of them participating in some of the same events. So I read through those nine lives three times, making a list of all the events reported in them. Then I made a list of all the events that appear in two or more of those lives. For example, the assassination of Julius Caesar is mentioned in Plutarch's Lives of Caesar, Cicero, Brutus, and Antony. So we can compare how Plutarch reports the same story in all four accounts. This is a unique opportunity and differs from comparing how the story of Caesar's assassination is told by several different authors. By focusing on Plutarch, I could assess how the same author very often using the same sources and writing at the same time, reported the same stories. I found three dozen stories Plutarch told two or more times in the nine lives on which I was focusing. My thinking was I could go through these stories with a fine tooth comb and observe whether Plutarch copies and pastes the same stories or whether there are differences. If there are differences, I could see what kind of differences there are and see if they shed some light on the differences in the Gospels. At this point, I recognized that this was a substantial project and would take a lot of time. So prior to proceeding further, I wondered if someone else had already completed what I was planning to do. Surely a classicist had done so. I contacted my friend John Ramsey, who at the time was teaching classics at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I asked John if he was aware of anyone who had already completed such a project with Plutarch. Professor Ramsey referred me to his friend Christopher Pelling, who he said is the foremost authority on Plutarch. Pelling was teaching at Christ Church, Oxford at the time, and is the former tutor of Richard Burridge, whose book I mentioned earlier has been a game changer in the discipline of New Testament studies. I contacted Professor Pelling, and he informed me that a few others had indeed conducted the type of, type of work about which I was inquiring. However, the most comprehensive of that work is a journal article he had written and republished it in 2002 as a single chapter in his book, Plutarch and History. He added that his research involved comparing seven lives rather than nine, and it only took a handful of stories into consideration rather than every story that had appeared more than once. So nothing had yet been completed that had the scope I was proposing. So I embarked on my research. I placed limits on it in order to avoid embarking on countless rabbit trails and never completing it. I also set limits by proceeding with certain assumptions. I began with the assumption that, at minimum, the Gospels share much in common with the genre of ancient biography. This is the position of a large majority of New Testament scholars, including evangelical New Testament scholars. The literature I had read on the subject convinced me of the Gospels' biographical genre. 
After all, if you were going to write about the life of an important person, what genre would you use? Poetry, horror fiction, or biography? And let's say you're a biographer in the first century, writing for readers living in the first century, about a person who had lived in the first century. Would you use the literary conventions in play in the first century, or those that would not come into play until more than 1,500 years later? The answers to these questions are obvious. Now, some have claimed that the Gospels are a unique genre and belong in a category shared with no other literature. This seems odd to me. Every other bit of literature in the Bible fits into a genre that's shared with other literature outside the Bible. So why, why must the Gospels be the only exception, especially when they share so much in common with ancient biography? So I began with the assumption that the Gospels share much in common with ancient biography. I also assume that many New Testament scholars over the years have been correct that the authors of the Gospels used compositional devices such as telescoping, spotlighting, and other devices. Although they rarely ever provided evidence to support their contention that these were standard devices used by the ancients, their proposals seem quite plausible to me. In fact, more plausible than viewing the gospel differences as errors or by engaging in strained harmonization efforts, especially since we use many of these devices even today in our ordinary communications. I read literature written by classicists, and I discovered that they also spoke of the same literary devices as New Testament scholars, along with a few additional ones. Classicist J.L. Moles commented that a number of these literary devices are practically universal in ancient historiography. Since Professor Pelling refers to them as compositional devices, I adopted that term. The scope of my project would be largely limited to examining stories told in two or more of Plutarch's lives, identifying differences in details, and looking for occasions where compositional devices might be in play. Now, if the majority of New Testament scholars and classicists are mistaken about the existence of these devices, then I am too, since I'm largely standing on the shoulders of Richard Burridge, Christopher Pelling, J.L. Moles, Craig Keener, and many other scholars when launching into this expanded research, a research that breaks some new ground. The entire project took around eight years. During my research, I was quite surprised to observe how often Plutarch appears to have used the compositional devices identified by classicists. I also read through the Gospels eight times in Greek and made a list of all the differences I observed. I then read those stories in view of the compositional devices posited by scholars and was surprised by how often the Gospel authors appear to have used them. Oxford University Press published my research in 2017 in a book titled why are there differences in the Gospels? What we can learn from ancient biography. The book received praise from Professor Pelling, who called it an exemplary crossover of classical and New Testament studies. Richard Baucom called it an illuminating fresh approach to understanding how the Gospel authors used their sources. Dale Allison referred to it as a significant volume, while Scott McKnight said it's the most important book he's ever read on the literary techniques of the evangelists. All of these are highly respected scholars in the relevant fields. The esteemed evangelical theologian J.I. Packer referred to my book as an accomplished piece of work, which it is a pleasure to commend. However, the book has received some criticism, the sharpest of which has come from Lydia McGrew, a Christian philosopher. She began to post lengthy criticisms of my book on her blog, What's Wrong with the World? She then published two articles in evangelical journals one of which she sells as a PDF on Amazon. Then in November 2019, she published her book, The Mirror or the Mask, Liberating the Gospels from Literary Devices, a 560-page volume that's largely a negative criticism of my book. More recently, she and her husband Tim have contacted a number of people asking them to stop promoting my work, asserting that it has been thoroughly refuted by her book. Friends of the McGrews are contending vigorously in their favor on social media platforms. Unfortunately, some division in the body of Christ has resulted, and this concerns me. That plus the many requests I've received to reply to her is what has motivated me to offer one. So, here's how I'm going to proceed. This is the first in a series of eight videos that will be approximately 15 to 30 minutes each. In the seven videos that follow, 
I'll reiterate the steps I take in my book and assess how McGrew has replied in her book. I will not be responding to everything she says. That would require far more time than I can devote to the matter. But I am responding to the major points. I intend to do this in a collegial manner. McGrew will no doubt reply at length. However, I want to be clear about something here at the outset. These videos are my response to Lydia's book. At this point, I have no intention of being involved any further in the disputes many of you are having. I have other projects that require my undivided attention, and I'll be moving on to those. So as you review my assessments, judge for yourself whether you think compositional devices provide a proper understanding of many of the differences we observe in the Gospels. If it helps you, great. If you don't like it, that's fine. Whether you agree or disagree, I hope you will conduct your investigation and the dialogues that follow in a manner that builds up the body of Christ rather than one that tears it down. There's room for disagreement. Be a peacemaker. With this said, I will be posting the remaining seven videos in this series throughout the month of June. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section.